Hello and welcome to Experience Weekly Data Talk, a show where we talk to data science leaders from around the world. Today's topic is biology-based mathematical models to optimize chemotherapy treatments. And we're super excited to have Dr. Paul Newton, who serves as the professor of aerospace and mechanical engineering, mathematics and medicine at USC. He's also the editor in chief of the Journal of Nonlinear Science. Uh, this is a very special edition because we've never really covered anything, Dr. Newton, about medicine and data. And so this is like, this is a very special uh, episode for me. Uh, it's an honor to have you. And um, I thought maybe we can get started um, with you kind of just sharing your story, your journey academically and what, where, like the path that you took to where you are now. Sure. So um, by training, I'm an applied mathematician. Um, so I was a, I was actually an undergraduate at Harvard and I majored in physics and applied math. And then I got my PhD in applied math um, at Brown University, which, which actually has a separate applied math department than a math department. So they have two separate departments. Oh. And those are really two different tracks. I mean, if you get a PhD in applied math, you're learning um, all kinds of things from probability theory to um, computational science to uh, data analytic uh, methods to uh, differential equations to linear algebra. Those are sort of the topics that you would wow. learn as an applied mathematician. Whereas if you go on the pure math track, you're you're proving theorems and you're um, doing all kinds of different things. So I like science a lot. I was um, um, always interested in physics and, and um, biology. Um, and so I went on that track. Um, and so that's my background. I did not really have any training um, in uh, cancer biology particularly, um, but that came um, really about 10 years ago um, when I teamed up with a group of people at the uh, Scripps Research Institute um, down in San Diego. Um, we were working, um, actually I got a phone call, sort of a cold call from a, a, a guy down there by the name of Peter Kuhn um, who is a specialist doing um, circulating tumor cell um, uh, biology, where he um, actually takes blood samples from patients working with the Scripps Green Hospital there. And then they, they extract the um, small number of tumor cells that, that come from a tumor um, in a cancer patient. And then they look at the genomics of that cell. They look at the um, all kinds of the physical properties associated with that cell. So he thought, okay, um, let's try to get one of these physical science oncology centers that the National mm. Cancer Institute was um, announcing. This was about, as I said, 10 years ago. Um, let's write a proposal and try to get a um, one of these uh, national centers where we would have a group of um, applied mathematicians, engineers, physicists working together with biologists and oncologists doing sort of what they call uh, a physical sciences approach to um, cancer biology. So we, we um, teamed up and we wrote a proposal having to do with the fluid mechanics of blood flow in, in the body and how circulating tumor cells um, uh, travel through the bloodstream and, and how they get um, trapped at various sites and then eventually form metastases. So we wrote, wrote a proposal, which I look back on now and I, I kind of smile at because a lot of the things that we um, thought we were going to be able to do um, really didn't uh, pan out. Interesting. Um, never had a lot of the stuff that did pan out, we we didn't mention at all in our proposal. <laughs> but anyway, we got one of these centers, and there were there were I think um, they there were I think um, eleven or twelve of these centers throughout the United States, and so we got one of these centers, and and so I was working with that group for uh, five years, um, going to San Diego a lot, and that I think was between um, maybe two thousand and nine and two thousand fourteen, um, and then since then. Um, um, I branched out and I work with um, groups of oncologists and, and, and biologists at various places around the country and cancer centers, uh, including uh, USC Keck. That it is so cool um, how you started like building this center. Was this really like the first of its kind? Because I've well, never heard of, of anything like this. Right, right. Well, the, the, um, it, it was sort of the first of its kind in the sense that the, um, the National Cancer Institute had this big initiative and a mm. big push um, because they felt sort of that, you know, cancer research um, had become a little bit internalized. And, um, you know, people make progress for sure. But the progress that people were making um, had kind of plateaued a little bit. And so the National Cancer Institute and the NIH 
in general, we're looking for new ways to um, invest money that might have a bigger payoff. So their big push was to try to get data people, try to get physicists, try to get engineers, try to get a quantitative science people, um, really, really mixing it up with biologists and oncologists who are, you know, tremendously smart and dedicated people, but they don't necessarily have the same uh, quantitative training that somebody who comes through um, a, uh, a an engineering, applied math, physics, uh, data analysis sort of background. So that was their really, I'd say, the brainchild of the National Cancer Institute. And then they they supported. Um, they had a big call and initiative, and probably had you know fifty or so proposals, or maybe more. I don't know actually how many they had, and they um, ended up funding about ten or eleven um, of them. That's awesome. So, um, you know, we have a lot of people in our data science community that are um, wanting to start their careers, looking at different paths. And I'm kind of curious um, for your center, when you're looking to hire or bring on a data scientist, what skill set is really important for them to have? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So for me, I think it's really important to have a mix of, of different kinds of people because it's such a broad area that there's not going to be any one person who's going to have a really strong background in statistics, a really strong background in data analysis, let's say machine learning, let's say um, topics like that, and a really strong background in mathematical modeling, let's say differential equations um, and, and uh, physical modeling and a really strong background in, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Python and and um, uh, coding and things like that. It's very, I mean, I'd say it's impossible to find one person. Um, but when you get uh, lots of people together, let's say five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people, and then you throw in a specialist, an oncologist who works with patients, and you throw in a, a biologist mm -hmm. who has a wet lab who's doing um, single cell genomics and, and uh, cell analysis, it becomes a really powerful thing. So I would say all of those, um, all of those tools potentially are useful. Um, so we look for a team uh, approach really more than just trying to find one person or two people who can cover everything. Uh, well, I think what's really cool is that the work you're doing is truly using, because people talk about using data for good and data philanthropy. It's kind of like a buzzword. Yeah. But what's great about what you're doing is it's truly using data science for good for all of humanity. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, USC, the engineering school, Viterbi School of Engineering has a has also had a big push, which our dean calls engineering plus, which is, is a kind of a buzzword as well, but it makes sense. And that is, there are lots of things to do in life. There are lots of, um, you know, there are certainly lots of interesting things that one can do as an engineer or an applied mathematician or scientist, but it, it really, um, a lot of schools are moving towards trying to identify areas where um, where you're really doing more than just um, um, you know doing science for science sake, but you're actually trying to have some sort of a social goal in mind or some sort of a purpose in the sense. And um, so that's that's also a big push at lots of different schools. This sort of engineering plus or science plus kind of approach. Well, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to see that. It's beautiful to see the work that you're doing at USC and your team. And um, so what initially, for those that are new to the podcast, um, I saw this article that was on the USC website about Dr. Newton and his work um, on, ke on chemotherapy treatments. And uh, what was interesting to me was I had no idea how much data and mathematics worked alongside medicine. It just never, I just never thought about it. <laughs> and when I read this article, I was like fascinated. So can you kind of share uh, first, like what the traditional kind of chemotherapy treatments are like, and then move into what you decided to do with your research? Sure. So in the, I would say in the 1950s or 60s um, is when uh, chemotherapy started and, and um, scientists and oncologists started developing protocols. And basically, at that point in time, the idea was that a tumor um, was made up of a collection of identical uh, cancer cells who were um, that were growing at a faster rate than the healthy cells in the body. And it, they might not have exactly believed that all cells were equal, but that was basically the operating assumption because they had no ability to distinguish among cells. 
So once you once you take that point of view and you view a tumor as a homogeneous collection of rapidly dividing cells, then clearly the approach would be to try to kill as many of these dividing cells as you possibly can and to eradicate the tumor. And so that was kind of the um, uh, operating philosophy and to a large extent is still the operating philosophy. And it totally makes sense if you have a group of insects in a field and they're destroying your field, you're gonna to try to kill as many as possible. Now the problem with that approach, actually before I get into the problem, let me, let me just say what would follow from that, um, from that assumption is that you would try to um, uh, use the maximum amount of uh, chemotherapy that you can in order to kill the maximum amount of cells. But the problem is that patients obviously can't um, tolerate uh, an unlimited amount of chemotherapy. So there needed to be some sort of a balance between the maximum amount that a patient could tolerate and, and trying to kill as many cells as possible. And so the protocol that has that developed is called the maximum tolerated dose. And that was what uh, oncologists developed. And, and they did lots of clinical trials on um, uh, what is the maximum tolerated dose for patients with um, in different age groups, for males, for females, and so forth. And they developed um, MTD, maximum tolerated dose protocols, which are basically off on kinds of chemotherapeutic um, regimens where you give somebody a, a very high dose of chemotherapy for uh, an hour, let's say, um, they go into the hospital, and then you let them um, uh, rest for a week and then they come back in the next week and you give them another dose and you go through this for a period of months and that's an on, off, on, off schedule. And that's called MTD therapy and to a large extent, not entirely, but to a large extent, that's kind of the standard operating procedure. Now you can, you can tweak the amount, what the dose level is on that, but MTD is sort of the operating procedure. Mm. Now, the, 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 um, uh, another sort of dose protocol that, is, that um, people sometimes use is called um, low dose metronomic therapy um, or LDM, where you're giving a very low dose of chemotherapy, but sort of continually. So that's kind of an interesting mm. approach that that um, that has benefits as well. Um, the total amount of chemo that you give would more or less be the same as the maximum tolerated, because you're giving a lower amount, but you're giving it over long periods of time. So you can think of low dose metronomic in some ways as being sort of like um, uh, uh, taking insulin or, or trying to treat diabetes where you always have an insulin pump on you and it's sort of continually um, giving you small amounts in order to keep the disease in check. But no one's ever really compared those two things in, in any kind of a um, quantitative way. And, and as you can imagine, there's a lot of other things that you could do. It's not, those are sort of the two extreme things that you could do, but in principle, there's lots of other things that you could do. So, so as I said, if you view the tumor as a collection of homogeneous cells, then you would wanna to try to kill as many as possible. But now people realize, and in the past 10 years, people realize that a tumor is actually made up of a, um, a heterogeneous population of cancer cells that are all very different. They're genetically different, they're, um, they're uh, different in their growth rates, they're different in the how they respond to chemotherapy and all of those things. So now the analogy that you should have in your mind is suppose you have a field and you have lots of competing kinds of insects that are mm. uh, ravaging uh, your field. And there might be one sort of dominant group of insects that are, um, that are the most visible and doing the most damage. But there might be another smaller group of very damaging insects that, that are also potentially uh, harmful. So now your goal, if you just go in and you blast those um, insects with uh, DDT and you kill the most damaging large subpopulation, the danger there is that another subpopulation of insects could very well survive because maybe they're resistant to DDT and then take over the field. And then you've got a worse problem on your hands because what you have done is you've actually selected for that small little subpopulation that's actually resistant to the to the DDT. And that is actually what happens um, and is the main mechanism of chemotherapeutic resistance. That when you when you blast a tumor with um, with just a, a single um, a single kind of chemical chemotherapy, you you actually can be selecting 
for a subgroup of cells that are going to cause way more problems for you mm -hmm. down the road. So you can maybe see benefits in the short run because as you're killing the, uh, the dominant uh, group of cells, the tumor might shrink. And so it looks as if you're making progress, yeah, but yeah. then um, inevitably what happens is that the uh, tumor recurs and starts to grow and it's, and it's a much worse situation because those cells are resistant to the um, chemotherapy. So, so then you can ask yourself, okay, so what would be the best approach now that you know that there are a bunch of competing subpopulations of different kinds of cancer cells um, or a different, or you're in a field and you have a whole bunch of um, different kinds of insects, then the thing to do is to, let's say that in, a, in an ideal world, you could continually monitor the different levels of those subpopulations in the field. Then what you would try to do would be to manage that competition. You would, you would, you would take doses of chemotherapy or doses of DDT, and you would try to kill the most, um, the most damaging insects, but you wouldn't try to wipe them out necessarily. You would try to reduce their numbers mm. so that they are then competing head to head with another subpopulation wow. and, and spending a lot of effort and energy and time competing against each other in kind of a head to head battle instead of just one subpopulation kind of dominating. So then the goal becomes, how do you manage that in order to keep the different kinds of cancer cells to fight against each other in such a way that the tumor is um, smaller than it, than it would be if it was untreated, but not completely eradicated? Because then what you're doing is you're managing the cancer um, instead of trying to wipe it out. And there are some benefits to that. Mm. Um, so, but that becomes a tricky thing for lots of different reasons. Um, <clears throat> one reason is it's, it's not really possible at this stage to actually, um, figure out continually all the different subpopulations of cells in a tumor, the way it might be to look at all the different insects in a field. That's much easier to monitor that. So that's a challenge. Um, and then the other challenge, it, even if you assume that you can tell what the different subpopulations are and what the different cells are that are resistant, what are the best um, approaches to try to manage that competition? So that is how we sort of viewed the problem. And there are other groups that are viewing um, uh, uh, tumors this way, sort of as an ecology. So people call this tumor ecology and, and um, using evolutionary principles to um, to manage a tumor instead of um, using ma maximum tolerated dose. So that's kind of a, a um, intro into the thought process that goes on behind uh, people that use Darwinian evolution ideas um, to manage this um, competition among all the different kinds of cells. So that is, that is amazing what, what you just explained and the fact that you're using kind of evolutionary, I think the article talked about game theory, mm -hmm. is that? the proper, proper term, yeah. um, to actually make cancer cells compete with each other. I've never right. heard of that. Right. It's a, it's a pretty new field. Um, there are, there's a, I would say there's a, um, there's our group and there's a group of people at the Moffitt uh, Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida, where, where my ex PhD student is now, um, a postdoc. His name is Jeffrey West. And he is working with a group of clinicians down there, um, and they're trying to develop um, clinical trials um, based on these ideas. And they have some very good people down there that are using these methods um, to uh, try to test them out in clinical trials. Wow, that that is um, so. Tell me about the role of the. So you have this amazing team at USC that you're working with. Tell me about the role of the data scientists or the people that are analyzing data. Like where, where are they, where are you placing them and what are they focused on in this research? Right. Um, so a, a couple people, so I have a, a group of about five PhD students that are working on various aspects of this. And then we work with um, other labs. Um, I mentioned uh, a biologist by the name of Peter Kuhn who has a lab and a, another oncologist here at Keck named David Agus who, um, who is a clinician um, working on, uh, he has a lab. So we work um, with different groups of people, but um, my students do several different things. Um, so some of them do uh, mathematical modeling in the sense that they're, um, 
looking at, um, as you said, game theory models of evolution and how to balance these competing cell populations using um, what we call feedback control or um, um, uh, adaptive control theory in order to um, design chemotherapeutic schedules to try to get these subpopulations of cells competing against each other. Yeah. So these would be uh, people that are getting their PhDs, let's say either in applied math or physics or engineering, and they are doing computational models of a system of equations. Typically, these are called the replicator equations, um, but it doesn't matter what they're called. Or you could do uh, cell-based models um, that are stochastic models and do um, uh, use game theory um, uh, evolutionary principles to, to try to um, model this. So that's one kind of a person who would be getting typically a PhD in applied math, engineering, or physics. And then another kind of data science person would be more of a machine learning um, and, a, and a big data kind of a person. And, and I have a, 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 a kid who's gonna be defending his thesis um, in August, mm -hmm. um, who's um, done an awesome PhD thesis using those kinds of techniques um, uh, to look at all kinds of different uh, cancer models. Um, he actually got his master's degree in computer science and then is getting his PhD in aerospace and mechanical engineering. Um, and he got a job um, already lined up, a full-time job as a data scientist at JPL. Which oh, is, wow. Um, so amazingly, he, you know, his, his whole thesis is all about data science's approach to healthcare and biology, and he got snapped up by a data science group <laughs> at JPL. Um, but he's happy about it. He wanted to stay in Pasadena. Yeah, that's cool. It must be hard to keep such a smart team together because everyone's like <laughs> wanting to tear your team apart. They all want. <laughs> it's, it, what the challenge really is that it, it's a little bit of a ramp up period. When you get a new graduate student, you've got to train them for a couple of years. They have, you know, they have to take lots of classes. They have to pass exams in order to get through the master's level into the PhD level before they get uh, really serious about the research. So it's kind of a big investment to train for a couple of years. And then, you know, they work on their PhD thesis maybe for two or three years or sometimes even four years after that. Well, wow. so I'm kind of curious, um, what other types of projects have you done with medicine and math, maybe in the past that you're really happy about? Um, one, of the, one of the big projects that we started out with, as I mentioned at, at uh, the Scripps Research Institute, um, was basically on forecasting associated with different kinds of cancer. In other mm -hmm. words, we looked at metastasis and we wanted to um, build um, what are called dynamical systems or forecasting models of how uh, metastatic cancer is going to proceed for um, different kinds of cancers. So what we used there were, um, were Markov chain kinds of models, which um, is a certain kind of a um, relatively simple dynamical system approach to um, predicting um, um, if you have data um, mm. that you can train your models on. So we've we've um, this is an ongoing project that we've now um, written lots of papers on, and we work with groups at um, Sloan Kettering, and we work with groups at MD Anderson as well as Keck. And what we do basically with that whole project is we get longitudinal data sets, and longitudinal data sets are um, are data sets that track large cohorts of patients that have cancer for 10, 15, 20, 25 years, let's say. Um, they, they track them and they keep track of every single time they get a treatment, every time that their cancer spreads to a different site, they mark down the date. And so we have a long-term um, dynamical trajectory of thousands of patients that are of different, let's say, ages, different genetic types, different kinds of cancers. And a lot of these cancer centers have these longitudinal data sets just sort of stored away in their files, but they don't really know what to do with them. They've never really analyzed them. So uh, seven or eight years ago, we realized that these longitudinal data sets were super interesting and super um, important and useful for developing um, models. And so we started using those longitudinal data sets to um, train our models, our Markov chain models of progression. Um, and, and that has proven to be pretty useful. And, and um, um, I would say probably we're, our group is most known probably for those kinds of models mm. um, since we've been doing that the longest. So um, I think it's I think it's awesome that you you were thinking about 
these different studies that have been going on, these different cancer centers, and then going through the process of collecting the data. How, when you approach these uh, different cancer centers, um, obviously you're a university, um, how do you um, deal with kind of the privacy aspect right. of the patients? Right, right. I mean, it's delicate. So what you, first of all, you have to, ha you can't just knock at the door at a cancer center and, and introduce yourself really and say that you'd like their data. That's not yeah. going to work particularly. <laughs> no, I mean, it, okay. It might work at Keck because I'm a professor at USC. And so I know people at Keck. And so th there is that, but then you, you, you sign uh, privacy laws and you um, go through some training having to do with um, how to um, deal with, um, uh, medical data. So that, that is all important, but really the most important thing, if you're going to try to work with a data center, um, is to have someone at that center who, who, you know, and who you've met at conferences and who you've, um, talked with. Um, so there's kind of a ramp up period there. You have to develop a certain level of, um, uh, I don't know, uh, trust or yeah. uh, comfort with, with, uh, people. And then, you know, then, um, almost invariably they will say they have data that is just sitting around that no one has looked at. And um, um, it would be interesting for them if you could do something with that data. Mm -hmm. The thing that's amazed me actually is how much data is out there in the medical community. And my little world is just the cancer world. So just in the cancer world, there's so much data that hospitals have that these that doctors just collect over years and years. And it's just sitting there in files and it has all this information in it and no one really has um, extracted that information from it. So I think that's a huge area of opportunity to, to, um, to develop um, and exploit. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's amazing. And, and like you said, like there's so much time involved in building those relationships, building that trust. Right. Because it helps you a lot. It helps a lot to be um, at a at a um, a big university that has a medical school and lots of professional schools. So then you typically would start out working within your um, university system as a uh, as a graduate student or e even some undergraduates um, um, that get into this. But mostly graduate students, postdocs, and faculty members that work together with the um, oncologists that are at that university. Um, what's interesting is I, I've seen like a parallel talking about data ethics and also the medical community, because when someone becomes a doctor, you know, they take the oath to um, to do everything they can to save human life. And um, there's now kind of a movement. And I think it was started by DJ Patel, who is the chief data officer for the White House under Barack Obama. Um, I see him now talking about we need to have like a set of data ethics standards that data scientists subscribe to, to make sure that we're doing everything we can in the data science community to protect data, protect privacy. And I'm kind of curious about like your thoughts on like how, like what sort of training or guidelines do your scientists subscribe to, to make sure that data is going to be properly taken care of? Yeah, it's very delicate. I mean, no question. I mean, I, I mean the whole data question as we've seen uh, in the last couple of weeks, it's a really delicate um, issue and, and the healthcare data and, and medical data is even, even worse. So, yeah. So, so most universities have um, training programs and um, systems in place that, that train researchers um, in the basics of how to um, maintain uh, confidentiality and, and things like that. And there are, um, there, there are uh, uh, checks and balances in place. I'm not saying that it's not difficult. I mean, it is difficult and you do have to um, you know, sort of learn some basic uh, tools there. But yeah, it's a big subject, no question. And, and there's, definite, um, there's definitely um, room for uh, improvement there because the, the whole, you know, the whole field of data science is just moving so fast and is ahead of the, um, basically ahead of the, um, a lot of the checks and balances as you can see from Mark Zuckerberg's um, latest testimony that, you know, he, my sense is that you know, I mean, he's doing, trying to do the best he can, but mm -hmm. you know, the field is moving so fast and, and he can't control it all. And they're, they're trying to stay ahead of um, a moving um, wave. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. Um, 
So just, uh, Dr. Newton, just one last question. It's a question that comes up a lot in our data science community, and it's around um, what advice would you give somebody who is um, finishing up graduate school or finishing up college and is looking to start their career in data science? And um, what, what advice would you give them to kind of help them on their way? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think that the, that the key to making yourself marketable, if that's your goal, which it probably is for most people, would be to um, really get a broad training in lots of different things so that when you go into an interview and you have a team of people interviewing you, let's say at a place like Google or Facebook, um, they're going to be asking questions from all kinds of um directions from machine learning to statistics to uh, mathematical modeling to computer science. And if you have um, at least one course in each of those areas, but of course you're going to be specializing in one of those areas, but if you have a little bit of broad training in some of these other areas so that you can at least understand um, the questions they're asking and at least you can sort of see how those techniques could um, be useful, it really helps a lot. I think um, I think that was the key to the, the grad student I was telling you about who um, got this job at JPL. He's very broad based and he can converse on lots of different kinds of topics from modeling to uh, statistics to genetics to uh, machine learning. And so if you, I think taking, taking one class in all those different areas that you're not specializing in can really pay off. It's great advice. Uh, Dr. Newton, thank you so much for being our guest in this week's Data Talk. Uh, for those listening to the podcast, if you'd like to watch the video or read the transcription, uh, you can go to the blog and the short URL is just ex.pn slash Newton. And, um, and that's also the place where we'll be embedding the, bot the podcast, sorry. Um, so anyways, Dr. Newton, thank you so much for being our guest. It was an honor to have you. You guys, you guys are doing tremendous work truly data for good, um, using maths, using medicine um, to help humanity. So thank you for everything that you're doing. And it's an honor to have you on our podcast. Thanks very much, Michael. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye-bye.